The format for this panel is not a debate, and in, unfortunately, it's also not a conversation. Uh, each of the panelists uh, will have an opportunity to make a pitch. The initiative that I'm working on, which has been, we've been calling it the High School Accelerator, but will be called Michigan Future Schools, is an initiative over the next eight years to start, 30, to start 35 new high-quality high schools. Once again, with the notion that we don't, that we will do, so there's two keys to what we're doing. One is we will only do new schools. We do not believe that we know how to fix failing schools. We're doing new schools only. And second, we care about quality, not governance or location. So we will do public schools, we'll do charter schools, we'll do private schools. We'll do schools on the Detroit side of Eight Mile Road and on the other side of Eight Mile Road as long as they're open to kids from the city of Detroit. The reality is, is that 35 new high schools will build on 10, not zero, not one, not two, 10 existing small high schools some, par some public, some private, some charter, where nearly every kid is graduating, where nearly every kid is going to college, and they're making progress in terms of academic achievement. Not great yet, but good. So, there, so the reality is, is that the problem here has not been creating good high schools. The problem has been creating good high schools at scale. Once the school's operational, then authorizers, as you know, have a role to oversee. And while everybody talks well about oversight and accountability, the issue where people start not being so bold is around enforcement. And enforcement is one of the things that is the least enjoyable about the authorizer's role. Having to look somebody in the eyes and say, you know, you tried hard, we love you, we know you care about kids, but we gotta take your license away that allows you to run a public school and get state aid money and as a board that you volunteered your time, you're kind of fired, and the teachers and the staff have to find new jobs, and the parents and the kids have to find new schools, is nothing to relish. The next 15 years have to be about one thing, performance. And the authorizers have the ability through the charter contract to make that a performance-based contract. They have a very uh, strong role in accountability, because when you get to accountability, the question is, how do you perfect accountability? What gives you the teeth? And there's been a lot of different groups that try with charm and persuasion. I've been in that role. And charm and persuasion is helpful. It's necessary. But at the end of the day, when you have to remove somebody's license to operate and get state school aid, it's usually insufficient. And that's where the strength and the ability of a performance-based charter contract in what authorizers can do is critical. You have to have a solid strategy that creates high quality brand new schools. Um, I also make the point in my pitch that you have to be about doing that on a foundation of the fundamentals. If any of you are about doing anything else, maybe like construction, you wouldn't dream of building something unless it was built on a solid foundation and yet we kick off schools without even thinking about some of those things. So my pitch today is to say, now let me help you think through what those fundamentals are. Here's the four most important ones. Good governance. How do you attract a board of public officials that are going to be capable of pulling off a high quality school? What about a school leader? Do you know how to articulate what that school leader is going to look like? How to align them to your plan and actually recruit them to come and be part of your vision and dream? And a teaching team, same problem. And the facility is the number one problem that school startups have. There's no startup money. There's no financing. Can you imagine going out on the market today and convincing a lender to lend to your dream and your vision of a school? It's like going with venture capital to the third world. It just doesn't happen very easily. So our pitch is we need to build an infrastructure that gets these fundamentals right. I'm going to be focusing on this idea of bringing talented teachers and leaders into the city of Detroit. You clearly have talented teachers and leaders within the city already. So a large part of this also has to do with how do you develop the internal folks that you already have. And you know, in the case of someone like myself, and I work with a lot of um, ex-Detroiters, how do you bring people back as well to a city that has a lot of promise and hope, but as many people have touched on, um, tarnished reputation. So one of the themes that I'm gonna focus, 
focus on in terms of in terms of this is this idea of building relationships. And so if we think about the leadership pipeline, if you're not building relationships along that process, and that can come off as fluffy to some folks, probably especially in the business world, the reality is, is that you're not going to get the kind of talent to come to a city to be a part of this difficult of a process and reform. So I'm going to layer that into the four steps of the leadership pipeline. So the, the first part of that pipeline is the identification of talent. There are groups like Teach for America, um, groups like KIPP, New Leaders for New Schools, Building Excellent Schools, I could go on and on, that have clearly had a strong track record of selecting leaders. And that process is really, really important. The development of leaders, again, there are local organizations that I'm sure are doing good work. There are clearly business schools in the state that have done it well. Think about leveraging what you already have. So endless rules and regulations and vastly more resources haven't done the trick yet. The only thing left is the one reform we've only barely tried, and that's rewards. Now, rewards are really any kind of incentive. It is powerful for two reasons. Now, first of all, rewards change the behavior of people who are already in the system, much more than piling more rules on them or piling more money on the things they're already doing. Second, rewards dramatically change the kind of people who are attracted to the system in the first place. So if you change the rewards, you change the people. If you change the people, you change the entire enterprise. Now, teacher, there is no silver bullet in education reform, but teacher quality is very widely recognized as having a huge impact on learning. Uh, the schools can't control the parents, but schools can control the quality of the teachers. Find a reform that draws the highest quality teachers and the highest quality leaders, and then connect them to the kids, and now you've got a reform that helps the kids. Not very much about our current system of rules and resources does this. I'm sick and tired of us sitting and watching year after year after year children being miseducated, uneducated, and uh, basically being discarded. We've got to stop it. There are two pieces that I think would be helpful for us. One is to establish a nonpartisan education policy institute. Secondly, uh, I look back at the, I'm old enough to, to remember the Civil Rights Movement, and I remember one of the keys to that movement was establishing uh, voter education programs that would provide voters with the information they need to make good decisions about who needs to be supported and who should not be. So a voter education program, mobilizing parents, mobilizing uh, uh, the constituencies that support education reform is critical. So I think with everything going on, I would actually elevate three things that I would ask this group to consider as you consider how you invest. Um, one would be helping parents become better shoppers. We have a lot of parents who pick schools based on convenience sometimes, even though this is a, the motor city, a lot of parents still don't have transportation, and so they're trying to get to a school that's close. The other thing that I would raise up is talking about parent advocacy. One of the positions that I share with many others is that don't be surprised when you don't hear the moral outrage in parents if you don't invest in it. If you don't hear their voice, it's partly because when you hear other folks pushing an agenda, they probably have lots of dollars to help move that agenda forward. You know, you have parents who may not get out there on their own, but they may work with some of the small groups across the city of Detroit who have figured out how to get advocacy right. Um, the last thing that I would raise up is parent impact. We know what the research says. The research says that parents are still um, you know, their child's first teacher, that parents make the difference. And I believe that we have to continue to share that information, one, to remind parents of their responsibility, that in spite of what's happening in your life, we have to be more responsible, we have to take more responsible, we have to take the lead, and making sure our kids get educated. 
Um, but we also have to support parents as well with different programs and resources. Much of what we do as an organization is making sure that those resources are there to knock down those barriers. And the, the last thing I'll share very quickly because my time is up is that I always say the best way to invest in kids, the best way to help kids is to help their parents.